Good afternoon and good evening to all of you in our audience in the US and the UK. I am Ann Walters Robertson, Dean of the Division of the Humanities, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Randy L. and Melvin R. Berlin Family Lecture Series for 2021, a series sponsored by the University of Chicago Division of the Humanities. Our acclaimed guest, the renowned tenor and author Ian Bostrich will spend today and the next two Saturdays of April 17th and April 24th, exploring and evaluating some of the works at the very center of the classical vocal repertoire. He will ask how they construct identities, historically, poetically, and musically, in lectures entitled Musical Identities. But before we introduce Mr. Bostridge, allow me briefly to mention how he comes to be with us today, not just as a guest of the University of Chicago, but specifically as part of the Berlin Family Lecture Series. First, of course, I want to thank most sincerely Randy and Melvin Berlin for their generous support that makes this annual event possible. Randy is here with us today. Very sadly, Mel Melvin passed away in 2019. Established in 2013, the Berlin Family Lectures bring to campus individuals who are making fundamental contributions to the arts, humanities, and humanistic social sciences. In addition to offering a series of lectures, each presenter develops a book for publication with the University of Chicago Press. With my friends from UChicago Press among our attendees today, I will mention that Danielle Allen, Berlin family lecturer in 2020, expects her book about democracy in the time of coronavirus to be published in the fall of this year. We look forward to seeing Mr. Bostrich's lectures in print as well, preserving his words and wisdom for generations to come. Today, I'm delighted to announce that the poet Claudia Rankine will be the 2022 Berlin Family Lecturer. A dynamic and award-winning poet, Claudia is the Frederick Eisman Professor of Poetry at Yale University. I invite all of you here today to join us in 2022 and each year thereafter for a lecture series that continually discovers new ideas and delivers fresh perspectives about our human condition. As a series, and not just a single lecture, the Berlin Family Lectures provide distinctive rewards for both speaker and audience. The presenters are given ample time and space to develop their ideas and supply the proper context for their evolving topics. At the same time, the audience can follow the speaker on an engaging intellectual journey and absorb the presenter's sustained argument during more than one presentation. For these reasons, I encourage everyone here today to attend all three of Mr. Bostridge's lectures. Although the series will demand your all too precious time, in exchange, I can assure you that you will reap the considerable benefit of an enlightening and intellectually rewarding experience. I fully anticipate that Mr. Bostridge will surprise and delight us with new insights as he examines how classical music can construct poetic, historic, and musical identities. Now, before Ian Bostridge begins his first lecture, let me introduce you to Bertolt Huckner, a renowned music historian who will in turn introduce Mr. Bostridge. Born in Olpe, Germany, Bertolt came to the United States to earn his PhD from Cornell University. Since 1994, he has served in the Department of Music at the University of Chicago, where he is currently chair. Bertolt has written extensively about 19th and 20th century music. His 2002 book, Programming the Absolute, 19th Century German Music and the Hermeneutics of the Moment, explores the dialectic between absolute and program music written by 19th and early 20th century German composers, including Robert Schumann, whose music Mr. Bostridge will discuss today. Bertolt's latest book, 
film, music, memory, combines perceptive readings of films with a novel argument for the role of music as a prime vehicle of memory in the cinematic art form. He is a beloved teacher of courses in all his areas of specialization, and he recently received the Quantrell Award for Excellence in Teaching in our college. During a year that has challenged all of us, Berthold helped create a virtual concert series called Sounds, Sights, which combines music with architectural landmarks on the University of Chicago campus. He remarks that at a time of empty communal spaces, this program shows how accomplished performers can fill those spaces with music, emphasizing the deep resonance between tradition and innovation that animates the University of Chicago as a place of listening and learning. Now, please join me in giving a warm welcome to my esteemed colleague, Bertolt Huckner. I'm delighted to introduce Ian Bostrich to the first of his 2021 Berlin Family Lectures. Ian is a world-renowned tenor, a versatile performer, an extraordinary artist with an unusual background, an Oxford-trained historian of witchcraft, a writer, and more recently, a public musicologist with a voracious interest, capacious mind, and critical imagination. Since Ian's lecture has an autobiographical dimension, I won't recite biographical details readily available elsewhere or review his wide-ranging discography. Instead, let me jump right into what we do at the University of Chicago when we invite eminent individuals from various walks of life open up a space of reflection and inquiry, aiming at different perspectives, new insights, novel understandings. Like Ian, who's about my age, I came of age in the last quarter of the 20th century when the lead repertory had been shaped for decades by the baritone Dietrich fischer dieskau who seemed to have recorded every song in the repertory, Schubert, Schumann, Wolf, Brahms, and many others often multiple times, with different accompanists for different labels. Fischer Disco was everywhere, and his omnipresence had become arguably oppressive. In the 1980s, I had studied with uh, Fischer Disco's last accompanist, Hartmut Höll, who had himself trained with the legendary Elizabeth Schwarzkopf. The prevailing aesthetic upheld the principles of classicism, clarity and control, polish and perfection, and the triumph of technique, all in service of the artwork, the score, the composer's intentions. But then in the 1990s came Ian Bostridge and opened the door to the Ian Bostridges. In the world of the lead recital, Ian's arrival was not just a fresh breath of air or a breath of fresh air but a tornado that cleared the terrain with an ear-popping force still felt today. In 1993, he performed his acclaimed Winterreise in the Purcell Room, sang at the Aldenburg Festival in 1994, and won the Royal Philharmonic Society's debut award with his Wigmore Hall recital in 1995. He started touring in Europe, Lyon, Cologne, the Alto Oper Frankfurt, and not before long, in the fall of 2000, at University of Chicago's Mendel Hall. At that time, he came to a seminar in the music department held across the street at Regenstein Library. So welcome back, Ian. In 2000, members of the humanities faculty met to start a new core sequence called Media Aesthetics. Its three quarters were modeled on a book of essays by the French critic Roland Barthes, Image, Music, Text. One chapter became mandatory reading for the sound quarter or the music quarter, the grain of the voice. In it, Bart famously described Fischer Disco, his total command of communication as a singer, his absolute dominance of diction, his conquest of meta by technique. Yet such mastery lacked what Bart heard in the Swiss baritone Charles Ponzera, whose voice had grain an audible element of physicality, corporality, body. Grain is matter asserting itself in the means and medium of vocal production, the lung and the tongue, the throat and teeth. 
Disco was all soul and spirit, Panzera all body and matter. This is where Ian Bostrich comes in. If grain or not grain is an either or proposition, Bostrich has both, both grain and not grain, both body and soul, both spirit and matter, even when they are orthogonal to each other. Bostrich inaugurated a new generation of singers. He was and is at home in the recital hall, but he's also a recording artist. He's not only a master of the presence effects of live performance, he's also a singer who uses recordings as a medium to reconceive song. A recording artist is alive in the artifice of recording, using the microphone like a microscope that magnifies every sonic nuance amplified for audiences that have become audiophiles. Old school lead performers and listeners had been looking for singers as actors going into character, like Schubert's Erlkönig, the father, the son, and the Earl King. Ian does this well, and we'll hear more about this in his first lecture. But Ian's voice is often pure matter, that is, pure voice, or to use a new critical term, vocality. Vocality is hearing a voice break in passages of raw affect or dwindle in moments of asphyxiation. So moving away from Brad's dualism, grain or not grain, unruly singers like Maria Callas and the book behind me, I couldn't help putting it out there, inhabit a third space, the space of vocality. And I may ask a question about this later. Ian Bostridge precipitated a reorientation to vocality in song performance that was itself programmatic for unruly romantics like Schubert and Schumann. A shift in aesthetic, sublimation to the real, from the ideal of beauty to matters of truth. Welcome, Ian, to the University of Chicago and to the Berlin Family Lectures. I feel very honored to have been invited to give these lectures, and I'd like to start by expressing my thanks to the Berlin family and to the University of Chicago for the invitation. It's a precious opportunity. As a singer, I've spent the last year largely unable to perform live music due to the pandemic. To that extent, like all performers worldwide, I've been forced to question my own identity, which has, for the past 20 or 30 years, been defined by getting up on stage and communicating music in physical proximity and real time to audiences in concert halls and opera houses. That personal note must, I have to confess, be part of what subliminally, at least, lay behind my choice of musical identities as a title for this lecture series. I've had an unusual career in that before I became a professional singer in my late 20s, I was an academic historian, a fellow at Oxford University. The enforced silence of the last year has given me the opportunity to fall back on my identity as a historian and to think. It's given me the chance to delve deeper than I might otherwise have had the opportunity to do, to delve deeper into the backstories of some of the great works of classical music that I've performed in the past or have been thinking about performing in the future works by composers ranging from the Italian Renaissance master Claudio Monteverdi to the 20th century British genius Benjamin Britten. In the lectures you're going to hear, I will be taking you on a journey under the surface of those works to share my excavations and to ask questions about them that are not usually asked in the concert hall. And what I want to show is that the tradition of Western classical music, far from being moribund or culturally authoritarian continues to be alive because it continually invites us to ask questions. The individual musical works I will explore prove to be fluid and open-ended while at the same time making us emotionally engage with the conflicts and contradictions of human experience including power relations, whether gendered, or colonial, and the way we confront the ultimate dissolution of identity, death, which has been at the forefront of many minds during a period in which so many have been lost to a pandemic. 
Music is unique among the arts because at its best, it embodies what the poet John Keats called negative capability, the creative ability to live with doubts and with mysteries. It makes us think, and at the same time, it takes us beyond thought. <coughs> In all performance, identity is something that we performers have to confront. Each time we stand up on stage to deliver, to reproduce, to transmit a text, be it musical or literary or a combination of the two, we have a decision to make, conscious or unconscious, about the character of that text and about the stance we adopt towards it. How are we quite literally to embody it? Do we take on the identity of the text we have absorbed or does the text reconfigure itself as it is molded to the identity of the performer? There are many ways of approaching this and many orthodoxies which are sometimes unthinkingly lodged at the center of critical discourse. Central to much appreciation of the Western art music tradition is the idea of interpretation. It's a strange notion and not really one which we would apply to the spoken theatre, to talk about a great actor's interpretation of Macbeth, Hedda, Hedda Gabler, Archie Rice, doesn't, doesn't sound quite right. We talk more readily of his or her performance. The actor takes the text and runs with it. But in classical music, there is also a paradox at work in which the ideal interpretation is a non-interpretation. In classical music, there has long been a tendency rather to privilege the text, in this case, the musical score, a tendency which reached its apogee in 20th century abstract music with the notion that the performer is an ideally transparent individual. Composers like Stravinsky hoped through notational exactitude to remove the freedom of the performer. Not for nothing did he experiment with the mechanical piano role in the 1920s as a way of escaping the painful necessity for the intermediation of a performer. Interpretation, understood in this way, is about taking the text left behind by the composer and using it to intuit an ideal performance which remains unachievable, but nevertheless an absolute regulatory principle and an aspiration. Much time in rehearsal is spent arguing about what the composer meant, though in practice quite often ignoring it. The ultimate expression of this regime was articulated by the theorist Heinrich Schenker, and I quote him. Basically, a composition does not require a performance in order to exist. The reading of the score is quite sufficient. There's something profoundly theological about this, as it reaches back to Renaissance debates about form and substance, but it's surely a kick in the teeth for the performer. Thankfully, a new performative turn in musicology has been recognizing that music quite simply is performance, not just the written text. Music is a quintessentially social activity. Of course, in our highly literate tradition of classical music making, the composer has a unique power, authority, and charisma. And the technologies of music composition and the genius of the composers who have used and developed them has created a tradition of extraordinary power and longevity, from Monteverdi via Mozart and Beethoven to Ades. At the same time, performers, like actors, have to take the music and run with it. The text we have cannot exhaustively encode all the parameters of possible performances. And while the text may be the starting point and research into its meanings a useful and constraining discipline, in the end, what we have is a recipe for making performances, performances which in one way or another move our audiences. <clears throat> this is in fact as much the case for instrumental music as it is for vocal music in the classical tradition. In a brilliant essay, the, 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 the pianist Alfred Brendel contends that in the piano music of Beethoven, 
over and above the analysis and deployment of structure, and I quote, it is the interpreter's responsibility to play the roles of different characters. If this is the case for abstract music of the highest intellectual charge, how much more so for sung music, for music which has a literary text and assumes, if not a, a literal character, as in works for the theatre, at least a persona, as in the world of song. This is how Edward T. Cohn puts it in his classic study, The Composer's Voice. If we take the art of song seriously, we must accord the same faith to the characters portrayed by singers. They are not mere puppets controlled by the composer's strings. They are more like petrushkas brought to life by the composer, but thenceforth driven by their own wills and desires. Thus, the vocal persona adopts the original simulation of the poetic persona and adds another of his own. Not puppets, Cohn says, and I feel he's right. The adoption of character, the melting of the characters of peace and performers, which, performers, which performance involves, can often take us a long way from what the composer intended. At the same time, one of the most powerful feelings one can have as a performer is that in what feel like the best, the, the deepest performances, deepest for the singer, and by extension, we hope, for the audience, in such deep performances, the song sings the singer. This sounds slightly mystical, and it's difficult to describe at any length, but it is an idea which does capture phenomenologically what it feels like to deliver a work of art and to be swept along with it, taken by surprise by the way it seizes us and takes us unawares. Moments in life like this are rare, moments of uncanniness in which parts of our life seem to connect in a jolting and mysterious way. Moments of what we might call epiphany. Art seeks out such epiphanies and for the singer they come when the song sings the singer. I wanted to talk about this confrontation, this adventure with identity, because over the course of the past 30 years as a singer, I have found myself torn between two approaches which seem at first sight to be contradictory. Educated as a historian and having worked as a university-based historian until the age of 30, my musical life was always outside this academic structure. I never learnt to play an instrument, I never studied harmony and counterpoint. Singing the great romantic songs of Schubert, Schumann, Brahms, Wolf, my self-legitimation did not come from an academic understanding of the poetical musical texts which I loved and sang, but from a commitment to a sort of intensity of utterance and that search to be so immersed in the music that singer and song merge. My singerly practice was never about transparency, but about merger and that paradoxical escape from the self which a certain intensity of performance can bring. At the same time, I recognised as a historian the way in which the music I was singing had emerged from different cultural moments in the history of the Western classical tradition, and that each, perhaps, deserved excavation as to the way in which character might be understood. <clears throat> if one's first extensive encounter with sung performance is the romantic lead, the romantic song, then the performative style one adopts is all too likely, of course, to be a romantic one. But Recognition of the historical roots of that style that one adopts doesn't disqualify it as an artistic approach. I'm reminded of the 20th century British composer Benjamin Britten, who declared that if he'd been born a hundred years earlier, he would have been writing romantic music, something he meant not as a statement of the obvious, but as a declaration of allegiance. It was Nietzsche who told us that every song is a swan song. For me, Every song is somehow romantic and involves an engagement with the great themes of life which the romantics explored and transmitted into the psychoanalytic tradition. Eros and Thanatos, love and death, identity. But in these lectures, 
I want to look at a selection of diverse pieces which might benefit from having their presentation of identity problematized and historicized. It's my conviction that this is both a practical and a moral issue. We owe it to both the past and to the present to understand the context from which art, rather than mere oral wallpaper, emerges as part of that mysterious creative current which attempts to bind together in cultural Catholicity the dead, the living, and the as yet unborn. I want to examine performative constructions of identity in music through the lens of gender, politics, or the ultimate paradoxical grounding and denial of our identity, death. Works that might seem difficult for us to perform, like, like Robert Schumann's romantic song cycle Frauenliebe und Leben, can be refurbished by taking a closer look at their origins. Works which have languished in an ideological no man's land, like Ravel's Chanson Madécasse, are not just aesthetic objects. Ravel's work exists in a historical matrix which both opposes and is complicit in the European colonial enterprise. In these lectures, I will be looking at pieces which I've performed or which I might perform. In doing so, I want to raise questions, questions which help the past to inform the present, the present to inform the past, and which can enrich as well as interrogate performance. I'm going to go on to discuss three works in this lecture from three different eras to look at the way in which one aspect of social identity, that of gender identity, has been creatively reconfigured by composers at diff different historical moments. This suggests that questions of gender have always been sites of complexity in the Western canon, but that musical works can provide an open and fluid space in which societies can pose such questions. I'll start in the late Renaissance with Monteverdi's short theatrical piece, Il Combattimento di Tancredi e Clorinda, the fight between Tancred and Clorinda, in which complexities of identity are presented through the telling of a tale in which gender roles are blurred and challenged. I'll move on to Schumann's song cycle, Frauenliebe und Lieben, A Woman's Love and Life, in which the romantic and romanticized presentation of a woman's life and love is complicated by the male identity of its authors, the composer and the poet. I'll end with Benjamin Britten's music theater piece from the early 1960s, Curly River, in which the assumption of a female role by a male singer broadens and deepens the vein of tragedy in the piece. Monteverdi's musical theater works, written in the first few decades of the 17th century, are now firmly lodged in the repertoire. But standing at the beginning of the opera tradition, before firm rules for what an opera should be had been codified, they are fluid works, strange and unsettling for a modern audience. They must have been strange and unsettling for Monteverdi's contemporaries. Orfeo, written for the Gonzaga Duke of Mantua in 1607, is more of a court entertainment than an opera. Nowadays, it's usually in opera houses that it's to be seen and heard. Despite all the philosophical and musicological conundra and paradoxes of what it is to recreate a work written four centuries ago, what is authenticity? How can we approach it? Despite that, Orfeo does have that strange and amphibious quality of seeming at one and the same time alien and familiar. It mixes together emotions that are recognizable and emotions that seem barely to engage with our concerns at all. This is what music of the past seems to do for us, to bring the foreignness and the humanity of the past to life with a visceral impact, far away from what some theorists and commentators rudely dismiss as classical music's museum culture. Monteverdi's Venetian operas, The Return of Ulysses, 1639-40, and The Coronation of Popea, from 1643, are much more operatic in feel, much more obviously designed for a theater and for a public, freewheeling with that almost Shakespearean mixture of the serious and the unbuttoned, 
which reminds us that these pieces were written for the carnival season, in which the social and ideological assumptions of the Venetian Republic could be seen, as it were, through a gaudy theatrical kaleidoscope. The world turned upside down. Another carnival piece by Monteverdi is even more difficult to categorise, though it's increasingly a part of the postmodern classical repertoire. Il combattimento di Tancredi e Clorinda, the fight between Tancred and Clorinda, was written to be performed as part of some evening entertainments in the apartments of the Mocenigo family in the Palazzo d'Andolo in Venice at the height of carnival time in 1624. The basic storyline is a simple one, while at the same time it challenges the tropes of heteronormativity. During the First Crusade, the Muslim woman, Clorinda, a warrior, unusually a woman, a warrior, finds herself trapped outside the gates of Jerusalem, where she is challenged by the Christian knight Tancredi, who takes her for a man. They fight. Tancredi demands to know who his opponent is, and she refuses, spurring him to further combat. The fighting intensifies, and Tancredi mortally wounds Clorinda. She asks him to baptise her. As he comes close to her to do so, he recognises her as Clorinda, the woman he loves. She dies. Combatimento has an experimental quality about it, and at the time of that first performance must have packed an avant-garde punch as a group of singers, instrumentalists and actor-dancers started in the middle of what was essentially a party to enact Tasso's story. The killing of Clorinda by Tancredi in an essentially domestic setting, close up, must have lent the climax an especially disturbing frisson. Here is Monteverdi's own description of the evening. Unexpectedly, and that's crucial, I think, for the impact of the evening, unexpectedly, Clorinda enters, armed and on foot. She's followed by Tancredi, armed, on a Marian horse, some sort of hobby horse. The narrator, who's referred to throughout the piece as testo, or text, begins the singing. Tancredi and Clorinda will perform steps and gestures in the way expressed by the narration, nothing more or less, and they will observe diligently those measures, blows, and steps. The instrumentalists will sound excited or soft, and the narrator will deliver the words set to music in such a way that they create a unified imitation. Monteverdi's setting of this incident out of Tasso must have had a peculiarly dissociated feeling. The narrator is designated testo, literally text, but a common label for a narrator or soloist in Italian music of the period. He spins his tail while two actor-dancers act out the combat. At four crucial points of the drama, Tancredi and Clorinda themselves are given voice. But did the actors sing, the actor-dancers, or, or did they mime as some singers sang the words, as it were, off stage? It's, it's not clear from Monteverdi's description or from the score. Monteverdi was especially proud of his development of new musical means to, to, to depict combat in sound, something he boasted of in the preface to the work as published in 1639. Pizzicati, rapid repeated notes, string tremolo. This was what he called in that preface to the score the concitato genere, the aroused style which imitates the sounds of combat. But what seems particularly notable hearing and seeing the work today is the sexual charge of the material from Tasso, which Monteverdi set. The aroused style may originate in imitations of the warlike, but its signifying potential can just as easily attach to a very different sort of arousal. In true carnivalesque style, Combatimento plays with notions of gender, emphasising the fluidity and performativity of gender roles, and the fight between the two combatants is full of erotic ambiguity. The viewers of the first performance would have been well aware of Tasso's poem and its complex presentation of the relationship between Tancredi and Clorinda. 
Tancredi first sees Clorinda earlier in Tasso's poem, falls in love with her and refuses to fight her. Clorinda herself nurses a secret desire for Tancredi. In an often overlooked passage from slightly later in Tasso's poem, she is presented as an active and almost predatory sexual actor, a challenge to the Renaissance norm, and one who concealed under the cloak of hate another passion. Oh, that I might have that man captive and alive, not dead. Alive I want him for a sweet revenge so my desires may yet be comforted. When the two meet again in Canto 12, in the passage that Monteverdi sets, Clorinda has put on armour which conceals her identity and her sex from Tancredi and she fights him adopting a masculine persona which Tancredi fails to see through. But in this passage set by Monteverdi, the encounter is as much an erotic as a martial one and combat is reimagined as a display of sadomasochistic lovemaking. Three times the knight gripped the young lady hard in his muscular arms and three times she slipped herself out of those tenacious knots, no true loves but the bonds of an enemy. Here Monteverdi's music irradiates the words with a syncopated sliding lovesickness. Could I have some music please? <laughs> When Tancredi comes to kill Clorinda, there is something almost eroticized about Tasso's words, heightened by the simplicity of Monteverdi's setting. Into her lovely breast he thrusts his blade, drowns it, eagerly drinks her blood. Her stole beneath the cuirass, sweetly lined with gold that held her breasts with light and tender pool, now fills with a warm stream. The story ends with Clorinda asking Tancredi to baptise her with water from a nearby stream. With his devastated recognition of her, a moment captured in Tintoretto's magnificent painting of the subject, now in Houston, which I'm showing now, and her reported redemption. Who is Clorinda? In a 17th century Venetian context, as the historian Wendy Heller has explored, the role and character of women was a matter for constant negotiation and constant debate, mostly, of course, by men. This was a polity in which women were excluded from political power even more resolutely than in other Italian states of the time, other states where the institution of the court at least allowed for the play of informal female influence. In Republican Venice, there was no such court. The marriage customs of the Republic, designed to safeguard the transmission of property, condemned many, if not most, unmarried aristocratic women to an unwanted life in cloistered as a nun. But Venetian women did write about the constraints under which they lived, none more eloquently than Lucrezia Marinella, 1571 to 1653, in her book, La Nobiltà e l'Eccellenza del Donne con Difetti e Mancamenti degli Uomini, The Nobility and Excellence of Women, together with the Defects and Insufficiencies of Men. 
Oh, that God might grant that in our times women were permitted to train in arms and in literature, so that we would see such wonderful and unheard of things in the preservation and expansion of kingdoms. And who would be more ready to make a shield with their fearless breasts in defence of the fatherland than women? There were during the Renaissance rare but notable examples of martial women, not all of them fictional. Elizabeth I, confronting the Spanish Armada in 1588, is perhaps the most famous, not so much a virgin as a, virag a, virgin as a virago, as one contemporary put it, in naught unlike the Amazonian queen, Penthelizea. Tasso, in his epic, managed to include the Amazonian warrior Clorinda, as Homer had not managed to represent the Amazonian queen Penthelizea in his Iliad, and that's something of which Tasso boasted. Yet at the same time, the Amazonian Clorinda was a finta persona, a marvel. And for Tasso, in another work, a prose work that he wrote, it, he saw that there were, for him, clear gender roles to which men and women ought to conform. Strength, commerce, and combat for men, modesty and household management for women. In a sense, Tancredi's performance of heteronormative gender is put into question as much by combatimento as is Clorinda's. The erotic quality of the combat is multi-layered, tangled, perplexing. Clorinda loves Tancredi, without quite knowing how or why, and fights with him to the death in order somehow to possess him. Tancredi is all unknowing of Clorinda's identity as a woman, but joins in this sensual combat with a feigning man. When Clorinda is revealed to be a woman, and what is more, the woman with whom he is in love, his sense of masculine identity is cast adrift. As for Clorinda, her agency is asserted by the piece. She insists on her confrontation with Tancredi. She pursues him, but she is, of course, punished by defeat and death. And her carnival existence as a performative marvel is a licensed exception, which only reinforces the mores and customs of Venetian society. What the gentlemen and gentlewomen who watched the first performance talked about it Afterwards, we shall, of course, never know. We do know, however, from Monteverdi's own possibly self-serving account that tears were shed. <clears throat> Combatimento is rich, almost too rich, in its texts and contexts to contend with as a performer. A scholarly literature of formidable depth and suggestiveness has grown up around it. The audience watching in the 1620s would have been well aware from their steeping in Tasso, as a modern audience is not aware, that Clorinda, the white-skinned Muslim, was in fact the child of black-skinned Ethiopian Christian royalty, another confusion of identity which would have given her baptism a particular force, especially for, ne for Venetians who, living on a boundary between the Christian and Islamic worlds, think of Shakespeare's play Othello, would have known stories of Venetians brought up as Muslims and Ottomans brought up as Christians. The, the historian Suzanne Cusick, to complicate things further, has uncovered fascinating possibilities of sexual double entendre at work in the text which Monteverdi sets, creating the prospect of layers of carnivalesque tension between the planes of battle, of love, and of ribald jest. How does combatimento work for performers in performance? I most recently sang it on tour in concert with the wonderful Italian group Europa Galante under their director, the violinist Fabio Biondi. As is so often the case nowadays, I sang the whole thing. The nameless narrator, Testo, Clorinda and Tancredi, not as Monteverdi originally arrange things for three voices. In this version, I'm a ballad singer on stage, telling a tale, 
an age-old tale, but entering seamlessly into the roles within the story. And not only when I speak literally for Tancredi and Clorinda with their words and their voices, but also in the course of the narration, as the musical narration bodies out the experiences of the combatants, aggression, desire, surrender. Clorinda's performativity, as she pretends to be what she is not, is echoed in the narrator's performance. It's a remarkably absorbing piece for performers and audience given in this way, belying its fra fractured structure and the many commentators who see it as an aesthetic oddity. And in its exploration of the fluidity of gender and sexuality, of its fantastical imaginings, Combattimento is far more interesting than Monteverdi told his public when he boasted in the first edition of how cleverly he had mimicked the sounds of war. So much more is going on. Combattimento ends on a note of uncertainty. As she dies, in the narration, Clorinda only seems to say, the heavens open, I go in peace. And this openness, this absence of a conclusive happy ending, is echoed in a fractured cadence, a sort of disconnect between Clorinda's sung ending and the played ending of the musicians, which arrives disconcertingly after her. You'll hear this in the musical example. Robert Schumann's song cycle for voice and piano, Frauen, Liebe und Lieben, A Woman's Love and Life, is a very different beast from Monteverdi's Combattimento. As is typical of the Romantic Lied, one of the most popular classical genres of the 19th century, piano and voice conspire to present a psychologically convincing persona, one with psychoanalytical pre-echoes as the voice speaks in conscious mode while the piano melds together the external world and the unconscious in waves of emotional yearning. It's a world away from the performative identities of the late Renaissance. Here's the first part of the first song. <laughs> Frauenliebe und Lieben is an extraordinary, compelling and moving piece of music. In the course of seven songs and 20 minutes, we are witness to the experiences of a young woman who falls in love, marries, falls pregnant, nurses her baby, and is widowed. If we only had a bare title for each song and no words to understand the detail, no poems, we would nevertheless still feel the emotional compulsion of the work, as we do with Schumann's wordless but literary piano cycles of the 1830s, the decade before 
Schumann began writing songs and the decade before he wrote Frauenlieber. The work closes with a meditative but devastating postlude in the shadow of the husband's death. The music of the first song of the cycle, which you just heard, that first encounter with the beloved, Seit ich ihn gesehen, glaub ich blind zu sein, since I first saw him, it's been like I've been blind. That music returns, but with the vocal melody at first veiled and then vanished, leaving only a memory in the mind, in the oral imagination of the listener. Charles Rosen, pianist and one of the great writers about music, has analysed the subtle power of this supreme evocation of memory in music. The postlude is a memory and part of the memory is missing. It has to be recalled, willed to return, as it inevitably is. Schumann has forced the listener to acknowledge the eternal imperfection of memory and to complete the song. The end of the cycle is not a return, but the ghost of a return, a fragment or shadow of the original. The voice no longer exists, and with it has died part of the melody. And can we listen to a small part? Well, we can listen to the whole postlude, actually. Frauenlieber remains one of the most frequently performed of the song cycles of the Romantic period, partly because of its sheer affective power, partly because of its innovative and compelling recreation of a domestic tragedy, but also because it's one of the few song cycles with a poetic pers persona which is definitively female. But Frauenlieber is also something of an embarrassment today because of the nature of the texts which seem to inhabit a world of 19th century paternalism, which 21st century singers and 21st century audiences find uncomfortable. Because of the romantic sincerity of the piece, it seems difficult to receive the songs, as it were, historically or dramatically, as the presentation of a world from the past or a set of sexist tropes which we resist. Singers and programme notes in the concert hall and reviews half apologise for the piece, as if it were a manifesto rather than a work of art from long ago. It is true that the apparent submissiveness of the poems can be troubling. Since I first saw him, I believe myself blind. You may not notice me, a lowly maiden. How could he from among all of them have uplifted and favoured lowly me? I shall serve him, live for him, belong wholly to him. Let me in humility bow down to my Lord. Two musicologists, Christina Muxfeld in her influential article Frauen Liebe und Lieben now and then, and Rufus Hallmark in his book length study on Frauenliebe, have attempted to contextualize and to some extent rescue the program of Schumann's cycle and the poetry of Adelbert Chamiso, which it sets. Little known now except as the author of Frauenliebe, Shamito, Shamiso was not a sentimental hack, but a poet whose reputation stretched into the 20th century and merited 
an admiring essay by Thomas Mann. Chamisso wrote a great deal of verse in a female voice, and in doing that, his aim was not so much to impose an unthinking patriarchal ideology as to make space for a female perspective in a poetic economy starved of female experience. And Chamiso did, as an editor, also publish poetry by women. But of course, the need to ventriloquize the female voice in a cycle like Frauenlieber is not a comfortable one for modern audiences. Nevertheless, many of the tropes of Frauenlieber, if we look at them, are actually borrowed from the catalogue of male submission in love, something Schumann surely recognises. Uh, we can see it in a, a song like the second song of the cycle, Ihr der Herrlichste von allen, with its fanfare-like motif in voice and piano, chivalric rhetoric transferred to the female voice. The sheer passion of Frauenlieber's rhetoric, musically and poetically, is a world away from the ideal of the sexless angel in the house. And could we please play the next musical extract? <laughs> So, what we confront in singing and playing and hearing Frauenlieber is a necessary complexity. The complexity of confronting a passionate woman brought to life in words and music by two mid-19th century men, and in turn, usually impersonated by a 21st century female singer. And the overarching theme of the cycle is surely not submission, but loss. Nevertheless, it's worth remembering the discomforted response of even 19th century listeners to the submissive verses of Frauenlieber. Theodor Storm wrote to his fellow writer Paul Heiser in 1874, Mörike, Eduard Mörike, the poet, once told me how distasteful all this was to him, and these are exactly my sentiments. But looking at how Schumann's Frauenlieber came into being can, I think, deepen our response to it and further elaborate the tensions of identity which give it life. Schumann wrote his Frauenlieber und Lieben cycle in the magical year of 1840, the year in which he wrote almost all of his famous song cycles. Uh, the Dichterliebe, the Opus 24 and Opus 39 Liederkreisen to poems by Heinrich Heine and Josef von Eichendorf, and the Kernerlieder Opus 25. Another one of the cycles, Myrten, was explicitly intended as a wedding gift, a garland of myrtles to celebrate his impending union with the pianist and composer Clara Wieck. Robert had met Clara when he'd lodged with her family as a piano student of her father's, the legendary great teacher Friedrich Wieck. Friedrich had raised Clara to be a great virtuoso, and he resisted and resented her marriage to Schumann to the bitter end. The 1840 flowering of song, a genre which Schumann, the master of the piano miniature, had hitherto avoided, spoke to that sense of elated productivity, which stemmed in turn from the coming fruition of his struggle to marry Clara. In true romantic vein, and reflecting the legal and personal struggles surrounding their union, these cycles are full of feelings of love, jealousy, rejection, fury, frustration, all the feelings that had swirled around in Schumann's head since he had first committed himself to Clara. As the conflict reached its apogee in 1839-40, to 40, Robert had threatened to kill not only himself, but Clara too. Frauenlieber emer emerged from this maelstrom in July 1840. June, the preceding month, had been a month of intense legal argument, and the marriage was to be finally celebrated in September. Frauenlieber then reflects the singular but vexed closeness which bound together these two extraordinary musicians, Robert, the creator of new forms in music, and Clara, one of the greatest pianists of her day, 
and a composer too. If anything is likely to confirm that Frauenliebe is not a straightforwardly soupy celebration of female subjection, it's that it was written by Robert with Clara in mind. Clara was a potentially brilliant composer. The current success of her early piano concerto, which is being played a lot now, is, is leading to a reassessment of this lost talent, and she gave up composing not long into her marriage. As well as this, she was one of the star pianists of the day, a much bigger name than Schumann. Schumann's attitude towards his fiancée, soon to be his wife, remained highly conflicted. His admiration for her as an artist was profound and lasting. My Clara played everything like a master, he could declare, in the second year of their marriage. But at the same time, it was compromised by a desire for her to give himself to him as a wife and not an artist. A letter of September 1838 could move within a few lines from a declaration that her art was great and holy to an insistence that my Clara will be a happy wife, a contented wife, a beloved wife. Just a year later, he was musing about our first summer in Svikau as married folks. Young wives must be able to cook and keep house if they want to please their husbands. A few weeks later, you shall forget the artist. You shall live only, only for yourself and your house and your husband. In the same year, and who knows if it was something of an insecure tease, Robert had asked Clara to trust and obey me. After all, men are above women. The reality of the Schumann's marriage was a complex one, recorded in depth in their marriage diaries, continually reflecting the pull between bourgeois convention and the life of the artist. Clara did cease composing, but she continued her career as an internationally fated pianist, often to her husband's frustration, despite his admiration for her superlative artistry. Frauenliebe seems to encode Robert's desires and anxieties as much as it speaks for the role of the woman who was to become his wife so soon after its composition. Here, for example, he is in December 1838 in a letter, prostrate before her, abject, abject and submissive. It's from you that I receive all life, on whom I am wholly dependent. Like a slave, I should often like to follow you from afar at a distance and await your slightest bidding. Reading another passage from a letter from Robert to Clara of 1838, two years before their marriage, it's difficult not to think ahead to one of the most famous songs of the Frauenliebe cycle, Du ring an meinem Finger, you ring on my finger, in which the bride apostrophizes her wedding ring and sings affectingly of her love for her husband. Here is the opening of the poem of the song. You ring on my finger, my golden little ring, I press you devoutedly to my lips, to my heart. And here is Robert's troubled letter. I think very troubling also because it anticipates Robert's suicide many, many years later. And now, since you value my ring so little, I care no longer for yours since yesterday and wear it no longer. I dreamed that I was walking by deep water and a, an impulse seized me and I threw the ring into the water and then I was filled with a passionate longing to plunge in after it. The deep identification which Robert felt between himself and Clara as their marriage approached is apparent in the envoy to a letter of March 1839 in which he seems to muddle genders and blur identities. Adieu, my heart of hearts, beloved brother of my heart. This is Robert speaking to Clara. Dearest husband, he uses the masculine form of spouse, Iergemar. Adieu, I love you with all my heart. He signs off the letter not as Robert Schumann, but as Robert Wieck. 
So here are more layers of complexity to add to our response to Fraunlieber and to the construction of the identity of its protagonist persona. Schumann's owning anxieties, his own ambivalences about his relationship with Clara, his own deep identification with her. What then would it mean for a man to sing Fraunlieber? There's a long tradition of leader in a male voice being sung by women from Schubert's day right through to our own. Fraunlieber is today largely a female preserve, despite the recent intervention of some distinguished male voices such as the baritones Matthias Goerner and Roderick Williams. It's fascinating to note, however, that one of the earliest concert performances of the whole cycle, with Clara Schumann herself at the piano, was given by a man, the baritone Julius Stockhausen in 1862. Our complex relationship to this masterpiece, our recognition of its compositional and performative strata layer upon layer, should surely now loosen the straitjacket of gender normative performance and allow us to react to the full range of the possible worlds it creates. I look forward to performing Frauen, Liebe und Lieben. Confusions of identity have been long-standing features of the carnival in Christian culture, and the carnivalesque has gone on to be a recurring feature of opera from its origins through to the present day. Gender confusion of all sorts has been as much a feature as of opera as of Shakespearean comedy, and in far more overt, if sometimes less tangled forms than in combattimento. The best known examples in the canonical repertoire of today involve female to male cross-dressing. Cherubino, the pubescent boy of Mozart's marriage of Figaro, is played by a female mezzo-soprano with a Shakespearean touch when this feigning boy feigns to be a girl in order to avoid being sent away to join the army. In Strauss and Hoffmannsthal's decadent and titillating Mozartian homage, Der Rosenkavalier, the opera opens with two women in bed together, a soprano and a mezzo-soprano, playing respectively the Marshalin and her teenage lover, Octavian, who then impersonates a maid, Mariando, in order to bamboozle and eventually humiliate the oafish Baron Ox. The era of the operatic castrato, stretching from Monteverdi through to the early 19th century, had earlier provided all sorts of opportunities for gender confusion. Castrated men with high voices singing both female and male parts. And in the 18th century, opera seria enthroned a counterintuitive idea in which the heroic male, Julius Caesar, say, or Alexander the Great, was almost always played by a thrillingly and prodigiously voiced eunuch with the power of a man, but the pitch and virtuosity of a female. Challenges to normative notions of gender in the licensed space of the opera house continued into the later 20th century, into the 21st. Yet the work I'm going to look at now, Benjamin Britten's Curly River, is remarkable for the way in which, far from adopting a pose of titillation or subversion, it uses gender reversal to produce both musically and dramatically an abstract, supragendered portrayal of universal humanity transfigured. Curly River was the first of what Britain called his parables for church performance. The central role in the piece, the madwoman, is played by a male-voiced singer. It was written for the composer's partner, the tenor Peter Piers, in the first production in 1964. I want to explore what the casting of a man in the role of a mother means for the piece and for our response to it. The first of three such works, Curly River was inspired by Britain's encounter with the Japanese no play Sumidagawa. Stylized in movement with a traditionally all-male cast, Sumidagawa tells the story of a noblewoman who has been driven mad by the loss of her only son. She comes to the banks of the Sumida River and while crossing it, hears a story told by the ferryman who had been mockingly reluctant to take her as a passenger. It becomes clear that the woman's son had been kidnapped by a slave trader 
and sickening, left to die by his captor alongside the river precisely a year ago. The villagers are even now commemorating the hideous event in prayer. The mother herself prays and the ghost of the boy appears to her. But as she seeks to grasp it by the hand, the shape begins to fade away. The vision fades and reappears and stronger grows her yearning. Could I have a picture here, please? Here's a late 19th century representation of part of Sumidagawa, the no play. Britain, on tour in Japan with Peter Pears in February 1956, was taken to a performance of Sumidagawa, and here's, here's his description of it. The whole occasion made a tremendous impression upon me. The simple touching story, the economy of style, the intense slowness of the action, the marvellous skill and control of the performers, the beautiful costumes, the mixture of chanting, speech, singing, which, with the three instruments, made up the strange music. It all offered a totally new operatic experience. There was no conductor. The instrumentalists sat on the stage, as did the chorus, and the chief characters made their entrance along, down a long ramp. The lighting was strictly non-theatrical. The cast was all male. The one female character wearing an exquisite mask made no attempt to hide the male jowl beneath it. Seized by the power of Sumidagawa, Britain and his collaborator librettist William Plumer created a Christianized version, almost identical in its plotline and preserving many lines of dialogue, apart from one crucial change. No plays typically had a happy ending, which the 15th century author of Sumidagawa, Juro Motamasa, had subverted with that tragic moment of loss. In Britain and Plumer's Christian reworking, the appearance of the spirit of the mad woman's kidnapped son at the climax of the piece, despite the tragedy of his death, effects a consolation which allows her to join in a communal amen. Go your way in peace, mother, the boy sings. The dead shall rise again, and in that blessed day we shall meet in heaven. God be with you all. God be with you, mother. God's grace cures the mad woman of her madness and atonement is achieved. The genesis of Curly River reflects not only the happenstance of Britain's trip to Japan and experience of Sumidagawa, but also his interest in the theatrical experiments of the first half of the 20th century. The no tradition was first co-opted into modernism by W.B. Yeats and Ezra Pound, who'd been close friends in the years before and during the Great War, the First World War. Pound translated no plays, and both wrote plays in the no style. The young Briton himself, indeed, was marginally involved in one of these no projects, helping to find a gong player for Pound's recitation of one of his translations for the Mercury Theatre in 1938. An early piece of no-derived music theatre in the Western tradition was Bertolt Brecht and Kurt Weill's Der Ja-Sager, The Yes-Sayer of 1930, a Schuloper, a school opera or Lehrstück, an uh, educative piece, based on Arthur Whaley's translation of the 15th century no-play Tanico, roughly contemporaneous with Sumidagawa, the Britain play. A boy, hoping to obtain medicine for his sick mother, travels over a dangerous mountain pass with a group of students, falling ill himself. He sacrifices himself to the common good and allows himself to be flung into the abyss. Der Jahrsager has none of the populist qualities of the Brechtweil hit masterpiece of 1928, the Thrupney Opera, but both pieces spring from the same interest in a didactic theatre. Both were staging posts on the way towards Brecht's fully developed ideas of epic theatre and the so-called Verfremdungseffekt, the alienation or distancing effect in which both audience and actors are prevented from losing themselves completely in the narrative. The ideal is rather that of the conscious and critical observer. Classical, classic Brechtian devices to achieve this include direct address to the audience, 
interruption to the narrative and more generally drawing attention to the theatrical process itself in direct contrast to the fourth wall orthodoxy of 19th century theatre in which the audience is supposed to imagine itself eavesdropping on reality. At first sight, Brecht and Weil's Der Jahrsager, an unforgiving exercise in music theatre as agitprop, might seem a million miles away from Curly River. And indeed, Britain's theatrical affin affinities were more in the movement theatre of the 1930s or in the French tradition, which, for example, lies at the root of his, his opera of the 1940s, The Rape of Lucretia, based on a play in French by André Aubet. Britain was actually unimpressed by the Thrupney Opera, and the Ayazaga wasn't seen in the UK until after Curly River had been produced. Nevertheless, I think many features of Britain's work echo the preoccupations which produced Der Jahrsage. The political message, the political aim and structure may have been rendered religious, but many of the theatrical aims remain the same. Demolition of the fourth wall, narrative interruption, a focus on theatrical process. Whatever Britain's own religious leanings or beliefs, he did repeatedly return to the use of religious rituals, practices and formulas as a framing device in his work. In that chamber opera, The Rape of Lucretia from 1947, for example, the male and female choruses, Christian figures from an unspecified future, comment on the pagan action which takes centre stage. But they're also drawn into the action, visibly and disconcertingly blurring the lines between narration, commentary and action. But it was medieval religious ritual that again and again supplied the framing device of devices for Britain's vocal works, both the overtly theatrical and pieces which are in one way or another more or less dramatic. Take an early masterpiece like the Christmas favourite, the, the Ceremony of Carols, uh, a group of songs, settings of 14, 14th and 15th century texts for boys, choir and harp. Britain turned this set of songs into a ritual by enclosing it within processional and recessional chants in unison based on the Gregorian antiphon, Hodie Christus Natus Est, and also by significantly naming it a ceremony of carols. Medievalism is also on display obliquely in the piece for two voices and piano, Canticle II, Abraham and Isaac, based on a medieval mystery play, and in its most developed form to that date in his opera Neuer's Flood, an opera for amateurs and children based on a text from the same Chester mystery cycle as is Canticle II, Abraham and Isaac. Britain's coup with Curlew River, a coup which his Japanese enthusiastic librettist Plumer fully recognised, Plumer had lived in Japan in the 1920s, the coup was the decision to refract Sumidagawa through the lens of the medieval and the Christian. This avo avoided all Britain's long-nurtured worries in coming to terms with Sumidagawa and, and setting it, his long-nurtured worries about having some sort of fake exoticism or superficial japonisme, um, but it preserved within a European setting all the performative aspects of the no original, which made such an appeal to the modernist theatrical aesthetic. Instead of slavishly mimicking no music, Britain used a small instrumental group inspired by the no ensemble to create a unique but equally austere sound world, melding together typically Western and typically Eastern musical practices, timbres and harmonic devices. It doesn't sound like pastiche, but like a new and autonomous development in Britain's quest for an authentic musical language. Could I have the next picture, please? A group of monks processes into the performance space, a church, singing the medieval plain chant, Te Lucis Ante Terminum. The presiding abbot announces that the community will enact a story of how a woman was saved by God's grace. The theatrical frame of the monastic community is paralleled and reinforced in the musical sphere by that use of the plain chant. Te Lucis is the source, 
Britain tells us, from which the whole peace may be said to have grown. And the redemptive climax is musically achieved by another plain chant hymn, Custodes Hominum. The monks who are to play the three principal roles, the madwoman, the traveller, and the ferryman are ceremonially prepared, donning costumes and half masks. Curly River is then a very particular instantiation of that multifaceted 20th century reinvention of the theatrical, anti-realist anti in its thrust and moral in its intention, presenting us with an exemplum of Auden's parable art, that art which shall teach man to unlearn hatred and learn love. That's W.H. Auden, Britain's great friend. And it, it's, that parable art matches Brecht's own parable drama from the East, the good person of Zeshwan. <clears throat> Returning then to the issue of gender and identity, how crucial is the madwoman's femininity or femaleness to Curly River? It's obviously a feature of the theatrical conventions which Britain inherited from no theatre and transformed into a Christian mystery play. It's easy to be confused by the whole business of sexual ambiguity in Britain's output, reinforced as it is by a long-standing critical tradition of focusing on sexuality in writing about many of his pieces, pieces like the Rambo uh, setting Les Illuminations, sensuous and excitable. The Turn of the Screw, his opera, bathed like the James story on which, which it's based in a murky half-light of sinister implication. Or his opera of the Thomas Mann story, Death in Venice, which is so often misconceived as a pederastic hymn comes swan song. Humphrey Carpenter, Britain's first biographer, writes that, quotes, the casting of a male singer was, of course, suggested by the no play, but like the use of a countertenor as Oberon in Britain's 1960 Shakespearean opera Midsummer Night's Dream, it carries hints of unorthodox sexuality. I think this is quite wrong. Uh, the casting of a male singer was not, of course, suggested, but was actually a cardinal feature inherited from the no original. And the playing of the madwoman by a man has nothing to do with unorthodox sexuality, and I think it's a, a, it's a bizarre suggestion, really. The gossip machine, trivially, did swirl around the potential campery of Curly River, and the tenor who understudied Piers in the first production as the madwoman, Peter Piers, the late Robert Tear, he remembered a slightly, a somewhat, slight, slightly bitchy put-down by Britain himself after Tear's first appearance in the role. Lipstick a little too white, I feel. Friends of Britain were concerned by Piers' casting as a madwoman, worrying that the effect might be like that of a pantomime dame, something teetering over into the ridiculous. And there was a pre precedent for this in Britain's writing for Piers, a, a deliberate precedent. Only three years prior to Curly River, comical cross-gender casting inherited from Shakespeare enlivened the sorry tale of Pyramus and Thisbe in Britain's opera of A Midsummer Night's Dream. The composer uses the faltering falsetto of Francis' flute, the bellows mender, played by Peter Pears, to tragicomic effect in his ludicrous performance of Thisbe. And looking at the photographs of the first production, one can easily see that the comedy of Pears' performance was grounded in a play with stereotypes of comic female impersonation. Next picture, please. The send-up of the reigning bel canto diva, Joan Sutherland, was widely recognised. And the music itself underlines Sutherland's ghostly presence with its echoes of Donizetti's heroines and use of the flute as an indicator of mental distraction. That the defining instrumental timbre of the no ensemble is the flute is a suggestive coincidence. But the madwoman in Curly River is not a female impersonator. And there is nothing funny about her or sexually unorthodox. Britain's fascination with Sumidagawa was above all a response to its solemn dedication, a phrase he uses in that description of his first experience of the play. And he noted that the, the one female character wearing an exquisite mask made no attempt to hide the male jowl beneath it. No theatre, 
from which Curlew River flowed is not kabuki, the Japanese theatrical form perhaps most famous in the West for its central female impersonator, the onagata. Kabuki and no are both highly stylized, but where no is austere and still, slow and economical, kabuki is glamorous and exaggerated. While Britain was excited by his experience of kabuki on that same 1956 trip, which introduced him to no, he didn't use kabuki influences in his theatrical practice until the third of his parables, the burning fiery furnace, with its self-conscious theatrical contrast between the extravagant and the austere. A kabuki version of Sumidagawa was presented in 1919, and it's here that the cross currents from west to east and east to west become a little dizzying. Pound's version of no style was partly devised by a Japanese dancer, Michio Ito, who had studied with Dalkros, the European inventor of Eurythmics. Diaghilev of the Ballet Russe had his dancers prepared for Stravinsky's Rite of Spring by attending Dalkros classes. And the Kabuki Sumidagawa in 1919 was inspired by Diaghilev's Russian ballets, which was seen by a Kabuki actor touring Europe in that year. Um, Britain's movement coach for Curlew River was Claude Chagrin, trained in the French mime school influenced by Dalcruz, which had itself been influenced by Japanese performance stars as well. The aesthetic which informs the creation of an essentialized and exotic form of female identity in Kabuki has little or nothing to do with the mad woman in either Sumidagawa or in Britain's church parable, Curly River. Onagata became highly skilled at producing a high-pitched falsetto for many hours a day all their lives, writes one Kabuki commentator, Ronald Kavai. And over many years and with countless subtle alterations, and refinements of technique, the onagata developed a characterization that, while highly stylized, is convincing enough to be recognized, and here comes the killer phrase, as a real woman. Um, in Curly River, the playing of a grieving mother by an unmistakably male-voiced singer, masked, is part of Britain's participation in the desire of practitioners in the 20th century to enhance the performativity of theater to move away from realism and embrace more generally the doctrines of formalism and a sort of emotional detachment, a making strange. The roots of these trends lie deep in 20th century musical and theatrical culture, and they twist and diverge endlessly, much to our confusion. But if the impact of the First World War was to entrench a sort of emotional reticence which went together with a condemnation of the sentimentalism of much romantic art, the disappearance of silent cinema and advent of the compelling realism of the talkies was to put pressure on live performance to be more performative, more strange, less real. Could I have my last picture, please? In playing the piece in the anniversary year of Britain's birth, 2013, some 50 years after the premiere of Curly River, we went maskless and gestureless, no theater free, as it were. I played the mad woman as I would have done any other part in classical music theater, with shifting gears between the formal and the informal, the detached and the engaged, the realistic, the expressionistic, and the ritualistic. This is the modern way in classical music theater, a healthy, and omnivorous eclecticism, wary of any one dominating theory, while inheriting, at the same time, the theories of the past. In the end, the mad woman is not a lead tenor role which fits into the hyper-masculine inheritance of the operatic mainstream. And I think it's interesting that the, the tenor inherits, in a way, the hyper-masculinity of the castrato. A strange paradox here, I think. Um, but neither, as I played it, did questions of the play of gender identity cross my mind or inflect my voice or my movements. My costume was ungendered 
Having a man play the madwoman without all the no apparatus retains the crucial, es uh, the crucial element of distancing, while at the same time broadening the appeal at the emotional core of the piece. This is not just a mother, but a parent, not just a woman, but a human being. This is storytelling in the end, and as such, all efforts to restrain and contain emotion, um, like the casting of, of a man as a woman, these are means to amplify the force of the story and carry the audience with us. I studied Brecht's great play, The Life of Galileo, as a teenage student of German, and I saw a great, great performance of that role by a great stage actor, Michael Gambon. And ultimately, Galileo, despite all Brecht's protestations to the contrary, moves us, working through and beyond Brecht's theories about epic theatre. Curly River is strangely the same sort of piece, and its origins in 20th century experiments and Japanese influences melt into the background as, like all great works of art, it is set free from the circumstances of its origin, from its creator and his own preoccupations, to find its own life. The madwoman in Curly River is all of us. Thank you very much. So welcome to the live Q&A session with Ian Bostridge. I will serve as the moderator today and ask Ian questions that have come from audience members. Uh, some of you have already sent questions, but please send us more. And um, I hope we'll, we'll enter into an enlightening discussion that has been raising your curiosity. And we'll have about 15 minutes. Let me jump in right away. Uh, there are a number of questions uh, from the beginning. One factual question. Uh, let's get this out of the way about the performers of, of, of the uh, Frauenleben and Leben. Which, uh, uh, which, was, which was very interesting. Oh, good. Elizabeth Schumann and, and um, I think it was Elizabeth Schumann. Yeah, it was all Elizabeth Schumann, I think. Yeah, it's, it was an old recording in order to give this sort of idea of how it used to be before it was, I mean, I think it was always problematic for, for, for singers, this piece. I mean, it did during the 20th century, um, yeah. Yeah, it's a really fascinating uh, uh, cycle, uh, and I, it's a staple of my my own teaching the 19th century, juxtaposing yeah. different perspectives, those of the presentist critic who cringes for all the right reasons at the text, and those of the historicist who, yeah. who juxtapose or who counter the presentists by... Um, by saying, look, you know, this was, as you point out in your lecture, much more progressive at the time. But we as historians today try to keep both of those in, in, in different corners of our eyes. There are a number of other questions that have to do with your identity as a scholar and academic mm -hmm. and your performer, how you integrate knowledge you learned, obtaining your DPhil and teaching uh, in, in, into your skill as a tenor and how you decided to devote your career to being a tenor after first pursuing an academic career? I think I was first of all in, uh, inspired by someone, I mean, in, in terms of feeding in other material into, into singing, inspired by a, a wonderful singer I met before I was a professional singer, uh, a, the Swiss tenor, Hugues Quino, uh, who lived to the age of, I think, 108. Um, he taught me when he was in his 90s. He appeared with he appeared in a Noel Coward show in the 1920s. He was written for a lot by, by Stravinsky. Uh, Stravinsky wrote the cantata for him. He wrote the role of Selim in uh, The Rake's Progress. Uh, he worked uh, on the Monteverdi revival in the 1930s. But his, he was always insistent on bringing other things to bear on your singing and not thinking only about singing. Going and looking at paintings, uh, examining the cultural background of what you were doing. I, feed, I mean, really feed, in, in first and foremost, I think feeding the imagination, um, which is is in some senses not close to what I did maybe as a, as a, as a, as a scholar. And I, I suppose my work as a, as a writer, since I've become a, become a singer, is I, I never think of it as particularly scholarly. I was really surprised. I wrote a book about Winterreiser, which was a sort of flight of fancy, really. Uh, I went off on all sorts of um, in all sorts of directions, talking about all sorts of things, and it did irritate some people. But 
But uh, for me, I, I, there were some reviews that said it was scholarly. And it, I, to me, it was sort of, I felt a bit guilty about that because I felt I, I hadn't actually <laughs> particularly exercised my, my scholarly uh, credentials in that. But I think, I think Fraunlieb is a particularly good example of how to try and rescue a work by looking at it in depth and looking at it actually in a, in a scholarly way, both in terms of performance, for, for, previous performance practice and also um, in terms of how the poems and the music were seen at the time. And as I mentioned in the talk, the, the sort of biographical um, origin of the piece in, in Schumann's experience of his relationship with Clara Schumann, Clara Wieck. Um, because I, I, I still find it odd that, that people, they, they, perform, they feel compelled to perform the piece because it's a great piece. And it's really a piece about, I think it's really a piece about loss primarily. That's what we really feel in the piece. But um, they still feel embarrassed by it. And it's almost as if they, they're, because it's lead, they're unable to make, to, to detach in that way that people do when they have something that they, that they really feel is, is theatre proper. Uh, they can't feel, well, I'm performing a piece of the 19th century. Uh, look at this. Maybe in some ways it presents things we're no longer comfortable with, but it gives us an opportunity to observe those and, and, and understand them better. And I think that's, uh, that's something I'd like to encourage in the, in, in the way people perform supposedly non-theatrical works is 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 to sort of see that you're adopting a persona yeah i mean it's an old idea as well i mean it's in it's in edward Cohn right back then in the you know when he wrote the composer's voice so. i i'm i found it really fascinating the the um passages that you quoted schumann writing and of course he he was and the romantics were familiar with role play uh, early romanticism as well, especially Schlegel and and the early romantic circle, and what's what's so interesting here is is this kind of cross dressing and cross role play, especially female and male roles are, are, are common in a kind of um, theatrical space. Um, so uh, th this makes a lot of sense, and uh, I, I think it's interesting when you say that um, the role transcends, as it were, the the uh, the biographical persona or even the gender and what matters is more like the the story of loss that can be inhabited um here's a couple of other questions um, um you speak about the song singing um singing the singer the song singing the singer um and and about breaking the fourth wall in this idea of brecht <laughs> there was an interesting example i was about when i was in a school i we performed that play in the different versions that uh, brecht laid out didactically um and so how do you how do you balance these influences as a performer i mean do you break the fourth wall um yeah, I, f I find it incredibly helpful. I When I started out um, singing in opera, um, I mean, when I started out as a singer, one of the reasons I resisted becoming a, uh, a full-time singer when I was an academic was because I'd been such a terrible actor at school. I'd been told by people that I was dreadful and I'd gone into directing instead. And then I worked with a couple of directors, uh, an American director called David Alden, and then particularly over a long period of time with a British director, Deborah Warner. And they encouraged me to see that singing songs was the same as singing in opera and, and vice versa. And I, I also read a really interesting book about Shakespeare by uh, uh, an Irish critic called Fintan O'Toole, who pointed out that, you know, Hamlet's soliloquies are not soliloquies. You're not standing on stage talking to yourself. What you're doing is you're, you're like, you're confiding in the audience. It makes it so much easier. I found it, a, a, and I found it a real problem doing working on Don Giovanni, on, on Don Ottavio, because he has these two beautiful arias. And if you don't think about it carefully enough, they can just seem like, oh, now, now he stands up and he has to sing an aria and be heroic with his, semi-heroic with his sword and so on. And I had to find a way of not singing that to the space inside the four, the four walls, as it were, but breaking out and actually addressing the audience. And that makes it so much easier and it's actually it's sort of the it's interestingly the reverse of what Brecht said I think it makes it more real <laughs> it makes it more moving it, it goes against the sort of ideological thrust of of what Brecht is, is asking for and, it, and that's why it takes me right back to studying Galileo at school and and I think our, our line as a class and our line with the teacher having seen Michael Gambon play this role was you know 
who cares about the theory? What matters is that this is an immensely moving piece of theatre. <laughs> Yeah, this is interesting. I always feel like Don Atavio is totally trapped, uh, not just as a character, but also the role. And I, 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 this is a beautiful way of saying you, you want to break out of that role, showing that you're actually trapped in it. Uh, yes, and he's also he's a Hamlet figure. One of his big problems is he can't, you know, he can't decide what to do. He's, you know, Don, Don Giovanni is for him a big, bit like Claudius. Did did Don Giovanni rape Don Anna? What did he do? Did he kill the commendatory? Until he's sure about it, he can't act. And by the time, you know, unlike Hamlet, he never makes a decision because the supernatural intervenes. And so he ends up looking like the ultimate wimp. But he's also a proxy for us. For example, when, when Donna Anna tells the story of, of uh, being violated, he's like, keep telling what's going on. I, I think that's so interesting. Here's another question about that fits into this uh, topic that we're talking about right now, uh, asking you to tell us a little more about the recitalist's relationship to the audience and how you negotiate the recitalist's persona in relation to the poetic of a song. I think for the, in terms of the re recitalist relationship with the audience, one of the things that's difficult and at the same time thrilling about the song recital genre is that you have to be intimate with and also threatening to the audience. And I, I know at the moment, you know, song recital is a is a genre which is in some places thriving and in other places under threat. And I think one of the things that people both like about it and don't like about it is that it it has to be a little bit threatening. You can't sit back and let it wash over you. It's, um, I mean, maybe you can if it's somebody with a glorious, you know, one of the one of the voices of the century singing waves of sound over you. But But for me, a leader recital is about addressing the audience and shaking them a little bit with you know with with things that have I mean last night I sang um I sang Revelga from the Knaben Wunderhorn in um in in Barcelona and it's a really it's shockingly sort of um shaking its fist at at, at God and it's also laughing at, at the nastiness that's going I mean it's it's a really shocking piece and that's what it, it should be um so that's how I, and I yeah, and I find and I find these uh, these mala songs actually more compelling almost as piano accompanied songs because they have that kind of uh, intimacy and make the singer larger than life in so many ways. There's actually a question here in that relation in that uh, moves us a little bit along in that direction whether um, uh, singers today. It's more a question of musicians, but perhaps you can answer it for singers, whether they should be, um, you know, be trained in this more today and that perceives a difference between what's done in England and Europe and the US. Is there something you can, does it ring a bell? Um, I think I, I sense um, that in terms of the training in the US, there's more, there's more, there's a lot of concentration on the voice. I, I feel there's a, and it's probably something to do with the nature of the business in the States. I mean, the theatres are very big. The the productions tend to be quite traditional. So the the emphasis is, is very much on a, on, on a, it's a vocal emphasis, which is great because that's, in, that's important too. But I think there's a whole other side, which is the sort of, the smaller, the more intimate, uh, where it doesn't matter. I mean, obviously, as somebody without the most enormous voice, I feel uh, that th th size is not everything. But <laughs> Yeah, th there's another, uh, I mean, it's sort of the conservatory model versus the one that you represent, which is non-conservatory. You come out of a, uh, of a different vocal tradition, vocal training tradition. I'm now teaching in a conservatory. I mean, only online at the moment, but it, it's 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 a fascinating thing to do, and I'm really enjoying it. And I can really see the the value of it, and it's a it's a value that's a a very broad value because it's not you know most people who go to conservatoire, I should think most people won't become professional musicians, but it's the most wonderful training for life, both in terms of a resource for non-working life and also a resource for whatever else you do professionally in your life in terms of concentrating on doing something very, very hard. <laughs> Two more questions. One very short one, one slightly more involved, and then I have a final comment. Um, so one is, uh, when when are we going to hear your Frauenleben? 
Um, well, this is. I mean, I'm, I'm this the part of writing this was trying to persuade myself to do it. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it. it's interesting. My, my daughter's 14 and she's learning it. So maybe and I've got to teach her one of the songs tomorrow. So and the other one is yet another layer by with with music that is about earlier music and all music is in some sense, but consciously so is like Zenda's Zenda's Winterreiser. How do you see that difference with the layers of if you want identities there? Um, um. Gosh, I don't quite understand the question. Uh, um, I mean, as you say, I think that the thing about the great thing about the the, the the classical music tradition, this this written tradition. I mean, it's unique in its in its degree of 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 its sort of literate nature. The fact that it that somebody invented a notation system back in the Middle Ages, and that as a result, everything is commenting on everything else. That's a that's a fascinating thing, and it it, it does. I, I mean, I think it works away from the notion that we should always be. I mean, I've been involved a lot in in early music or the authentic movement, whatever you want to call it. But I think in the end, we just have to we have to find. For me, I'm always a romantic. We have to find something emotionally uh, emotionally that, that works. I think that's what I'd say. Yeah. Okay, let me make a final comment. This is not a question you should ask because it's kind of a curved wall of sorts, uh, but it emerges from from a lot of things that you say in your lecture, which I think is extra. Is it's incredibly thought provoking. I was harking back to when when you uh, spoke to Susan Zontag's uh, book, nineteen ninety book, Gender Trouble, where she says that gender identity is an effect of gender performance, and she points to drag performing anatomical sex or gender identity, drag reveals the imitative structure of gender itself and its contingency. Um, but what has e e emerged in the wake of Susan's critical intervention is, uh, is an attempt to go beyond binaries, open up other spaces defined not by the either of male and female or the both end of bisexuality. It's, it's a third space, a non-binary space of transgender and gender queer identity, which is also a realm of queer epistemology and thought and, and you know, thinking around straight angles. Uh, there's a beautiful German word, querdenker. Um, so the social and political power of non-binary thinking and identity has become really palpable uh, of recent in that it dislodges more than anything else, I think, the dualisms of Western thought and social organization at its very foundations. And it seems, this is, this is the thought perhaps to end with, that music for all its participation in gender construction and gender subversion, trouser roles, cross-dressing characters, cross-voicing singers, castrati and all, is also a third space move, uh, moving from gender bending to gender suspending. And one thing I take away from your lecture today is that perhaps David Bowie and Ian Bostridge both inhabit the same space. Singers who are not just transcending gender boundaries, but also trans-sounding them. So in that sense, I, I want to thank you for venturing into that space, not just as a singer, but also as a thinker. Thank you very much. OK, so thank you for joining us uh, today and during this wonderful discussion about, about Ian's uh, first Berlin family lecture, Identity and Performance. We hope you can join us for a second le lecture on April 17th, Saturday at 1 p.m. Central Daylight Time. And Ian will be discussing hidden histories in Maurice Ravel's Songs of Madagascar. Have a wonderful rest of your day.